Okay, good to see you again, or most of those we didn't lose since the last meeting, although we had open access until now. Um, <coughs> so, welcome to the second session on access. And um, let me try. Um, <coughs> We have the questions again, um, and we will continue to discuss along these question lines. Um, the first is um, maybe a little general. It's about how to balance and manage the different needs and selection and implementation of access for the different user communities. In the presentations, there was uh, there was strong message that that uh, experience shows that the user communities widen and I think you most of you have met this experience and um, how should this be addressed how do you address these what would you expect from Estri or from others doing this okay the floor is open um, I think the microphone the other microphone did it's not work there. Oh, it's there okay perfect So, I mean, if you have your own community, that this is kind of like black belt users, right? So, so they just use the normal procedure, they know how it works. You have uh, new ones. First of all, training is a huge aspect that you have to offer, but also very intensive user support. So you have to have the managers of the infrastructures that help users from the beginning. It's not, so for us, it's already at the proposal stage. Before they will write proposal, they can contact us and we can explain them a lot. We can check, we can assess them with the proposal. Then when the proposal is not successful, they receive a very detailed feedback, why? So this is also important. It's not only the score you didn't make it, doesn't help. And after all, also big assistance by the observations in this case, because we are with the telescopes, and, and also by the data analysis. They need this too. With the archive, is also you, you will need, we recognize now we need really invest in expertise. So create new access to the expertise that we have, because the new users will be sometimes not interested to understand how the instrument works, but they want to know how the result is in this wavelength or in, with this telescope. So this is, it's, it's a new access, not the classical that we have, it's suddenly really access to the time of the experts. And so this is also important to see that, that it develops with. So, I, so I'd like to build on this. So in, in our case, we are a distributed data infrastructure. Um, and uh, I think the most important access is actually the access to the time of the experts within the national nodes. The, the other things are relatively scalable, but, but that is really, and if I look at the actions within Elixir, most of our national nodes are investing in sort of scalable models of user support. Uh, but the other point I want to make, I think it's, for us as a distributed infrastructure, uh, it's, we, we try to differentiate between different um, modes of access. And so one really important part for us is, of course, the, the national centers provide support to the national users. And, and so what you do as a European infrastructure there is really adding value to the national investments, and that can be sharing costs and capacity building for the training programs or you develop systems, these scalable user access systems so that lower the cost of operations of individual nodes. So I think that's, an, uh, that's one important access model. Another important uh, access model for distributed infrastructures I think is what we see a lot of bi or trilateral collaborations and so where the say the nodes in two countries are supporting research programs that are funded by the national funders in those two countries. And so they help to drive bi and trilateral collaborations, which I, I think is really 
valuable and, and really interesting. And then the third, uh, which is the, the one which is easy to think about, is the large European scale access programs, whether it's the I3s or serve type calls or working with the missions or the, the partnerships. But I think it's, we shouldn't forget those two uh, first access models where, they did, where you support the national users or to drive by a trilateral collaboration between uh, countries. <laughs> Just one question, you mentioned uh, that um, things change. It's okay. That uh, uh, the need for, for training changes, so there is apparently a development that, in, at least in some communities, the training uh, bears fruit so that there is a, a certain set of researchers in some communities that do have experience with the access then, and um, also um, you are building up a community outside the, your, your core community for people who, who know to deal with the instruments, right? Yeah, okay, yeah, please. No, basically it's what I wanted to emphasize. First, I fully support what, what you said. We have the same problem at your brain that you, the one you have at Elixir, so I fully support all what you said, but I wanted to put emphasis on the and the training programs, because uh, as we are a rather young infrastructure, we are not well known yet, and, and we really, and, and also the, the approach we have are pretty new for the neuroscientific community, and so we need to train a lot. And, and, and we have set up already a series of programs at the national level, but now we, we, we really need to, um, to you know, to, uh, to harmonize that, to organize this at the, at the European level, and it's, it's something which is very important for us to attract the, the new users and to allow them to fully benefit from the infrastructure. Um, well, I fully agree with uh, what has been said uh, up to now. Uh, another key point that I think it's important is uh, we are talking about the um, rights for the users, uh, how the research infrastructures have to um, explain them how to use the, the, um, the equipment, the facilities, and uh, we should also try to talk about the duties of the, of the users. I mean, when they access to the research infrastructure, they have to know that after that, they have to share the data, they have to mention where this project has been done, because uh, that's something that will be helpful for others. So I think uh, we have to um, attract them uh, and make them participants of all the ecosystem uh, surrounding the, the, the access. And another, another point is, um, I think it's, it's good from the research infrastructure to explain um, clearly uh, if the process is excellence driven, the selection is uh, excellence driven, if there's a percentage of the capacity of the research infrastructure that is going to be offered a, uh, market-driven, subject to some fees for the industry, for example. Um, so that kind of information, I think it should be uh, needed to, to explain clearly. Thank you. I would like to give you uh, our experience in operating solar telescopes. And this is uh, the experience that we are using for the future use of VST. So presently, this has changed dramatically in the last years. Now, presently, we have two types of users, or three types of users. First, those who are experienced, then they don't need uh, help and they can do that by themselves. Those who are non-experienced, and they, we provide help for them, for, the, for taking the data, for reducing the data, and then for using the data. And then the third type of special users are students. So students, they are learning. Sometimes they want to do things this way, but they need to go the other way. Also, we have the policy that our data are open to the world after one year. So if the data belong to a campaign uh, with a student, then the data are kept closed for three years. So that gives more time for the data analysis, so etc. So we have th these three types of, of users. And then concerning the access, once we put the data open, after one year or three years, they are fully calibrated uh, uh, on the side of the project. 
But as soon as the data are calibrated, more and more unexperienced observers or, or, or users want to make use of the data. And then they require more elaborated data. And this requires more resources, more, more funds, and we are trying to solve that the way we can. We are now on that direction now. Up to now, we were happy with the calibrated data. Ten years ago, we did not provide even the calibrated data. And now we are trying to provide also second generation so products of the calibrated data. Now we are on that, on, on that process. Okay, just a question for understanding from my side. So uh, there is a problem with, uh, let's say, the post-experimental curation of the data, where they are stored, how they are curated, and... Um, we reach agreement between us. You take, they need to take charge of the reduction and of the data. You take charge of the, of the storage. You take charge of distributing them to the world. Mm -hmm. So this is something that internally, it's not easy because every time we discuss this, this involves funding, which in general, sometimes we have it, sometimes we don't. from our experience in, in radio astronomy, because the, the radio telescope uh, decided, I think it was 60s, to make open skies. Mm -hmm. So everybody could worldwide use the telescopes spread around for free. You just have to apply with the proposal and it has to be excellent science proposal, of course, technically feasibility. So the one possibility, what you say, what we also use as the, the uh, EU possibility is transnational access, so this is the classical use of the telescope that everybody knows. We have virtual access tool that we use for the archives, and what we recognize now, we have to introduce a tool, transnational access or virtual access, to the expertise. We have to mm -hmm. think about this, how, how to set it up, but it's probably mostly virtual access done, but to charge, as you said, yes to see that uh, this, this can be done. So, so this is what I mean by the development, how it goes. What I wanted also to add with this balance on these new needs is what we had before in other programs, we have networking activities. And this was the place where we could organize also forums of new users just to check why they, what, they, what the obstacles are, what we have to offer, what are the, co what what, what are the differences and that why they don't use our infrastructure, what, what we can do. Now it's more difficult because now the frame of the new calls that we have are either uh, development or self, which has some training, but not this, this feedback from, from networking. Okay, I would like to move to the next point. Sorry for that, um, because we have to go through our agenda. <clears throat> what I took so far was um, that um, we need increasingly now training programs for new users, which means a, a higher demand on the time of the experts at the facilities for this training. Um, they are separate from what needs to be done for uh, students, so uh, this is a new thing. Um, we should be clear about, um, oh, oh no, the um, training programs should also be considered in the funding of the RIs. Mm -hmm. Whatever you do, whether you make fora or need additional staff for training. And um, <coughs> the conditions for the user access should be um, explained clearly before users apply so that they know what, what comes for them. And all, there's also a problem with the post experimental cur curation of the data, um, which needs to be solved by the RIs, probably by funders, or through other organizations which deals specifically with uh, data storage and data curation. Okay, so let's move to the next point, um, which is, um, oh, sorry. Um, 
The service highlighted the access to data and to digital infrastructures, um, or that access to data and digital infrastructures are not appropriately considered by the current charter. Um, many respondents also pointed out the insufficient guidelines and practical indications on access to industry. How should these points be addressed and um, how should, could we ensure the right balance between general applicability and appropriate guidelines? Um, are there any viewpoints to this? So we need to find solution. Either it's no question or we need to find solution by ourselves. So it's, a, it's about Charter of Access. Yeah. But charter of Access cannot be so detailed, right? So, and, and I think it is up to, the, it comes back to what you said, that each infrastructure is obliged to explain the use of everything, how it goes. If it's industry user or other user, what are the conditions after? So this is up to the infrastructure down to make it. In the, char uh, in the, the charter uh, that we have from the commission has to be brought, but maybe just to stronger say that it must to be defined and explained so that there will be no surprises. Well, just to say something, I think it is uh, crucial to have uh, common formats, common metadata, so that you can you can access the data with uh, normal tools, so that, you, so that you can extract the information from the metadata, so that you can produce, I don't know, um, graphs or images or whatever that can help the user to know exactly what uh, this data set I I it looks like. But this is something we are working on. It's always, it can be uh, improved, but the, at least in, in our field, this minimum amount of information is, uh, so in, first, the standard formatting of the data is agreed by, by us, and second, the metadata to produce the minimum amount of information to understand what's in each file is, uh, is produced. I don't know if this is the case for, mm -hmm. for all fields. Yes. A very short comment, which is maybe obvious to all of you, but maybe it's best uh, to, 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 to say it, is that uh, good practice is asking for a data management plan with the uh, application for experimental time. Thank you. I mean, here we're talking about the charter, so I would be very much in favor of keeping that slim and not too detailed. And if we start, I mean, IPR is, uh, you can you can fill libraries on, on IPR. Um, I think it would be very useful to have a website for the charter, which also has some good practice examples, some links to the IPR help desk, to, to possibly um, dedicated uh, documents, etc. But don't clutter up the, the charter with these kind of issues. Yeah, I, I would say the same. I think it's important that the charter just set out general high-level principles. And, and I think it's a bit like the landscape. It, it has important uh, sort of implications for the programming, both in the infrastructures and from the funders. If uh, we state an ambition of uh, open, fair data from uh, uh, as a result of facility access and, and that the data set should be reusable, well, that means that the facilities will need to invest in the expertise to support the users to make that happen. And I think it's, uh, if the charter states that as an ambition, the detailed programming below can sit in many different documents and an implementation mechanism, but you can hook that to the, to the charter. And I, I think that that is an important ambition. And, and it's a huge challenge both in getting the expertise the training and the scalable support system for a large number of users. So we shouldn't underestimate the impact of that simple statement. <laughs> okay, thank you. And now Michael, and then I would like to stop this round again and move to the next Th topic. Thank you. I, 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 so the, the next session after this is about industry cooperation. And mm -hmm. I'm laughing here because <laughs> You're going to hear this many of these points coming up again, of course, and it's really interesting and it's good. 
and I, I agree with what you said about like having the charter up on a website. I think and something that we noted as well, and it's industry said it, is if there was a knowledge sharing platform as well, almost where you have um, personnel, individuals who, well, we, we've done it this way, we're really good at it and we can tell you how, how it works and sort of creating almost a web of expertise, knowledge sharing across across the um, across Europe to sort of uh, help those that are perhaps struggling with engagement, and in this case with industry, but it could be in any sort of uh, opening access, because clearly some infrastructures are doing it much better than others, and being able to create that. So it's the same point again, but I think just enrich it a little bit. So we've actually done exactly that in, within the context of an IMI project with industry. We call it the FAIR cookbook, and it was sharing recipes developed both by academic partners and the industry partners for specific data types. And it's practical and it's very well appreciated by the community. So I think it's an excellent point. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, well, okay. <laughs> no, uh, okay, now you have frustrated me because I'm a lawyer and I love thick, te thick textbooks. Um, so, um, uh, <laughs> okay, no, but uh, I think the clear message is the charter should only lay down the basic principles, should not be, not go too much into detail. This would be a task of the RIs in defining their access policies to work out the details. Um, and um, the... Um, now, other message is that the changes in access bring with it um, also challenges to the funding of the RIs. They need to ac accommodate this somehow into their budget, and this needs to be recognized by the funders. And um, what I also found very helpful was the remark that um, um, a cross-institutional or uh, communication, a web of expertise amongst different RIs for questions of access should be um, opened. You should have the chance uh, and 